Hey guys, this is Jamie with Out of Bounds with Jamie and Abby. This month's episode, we will have Mima McCormick here. She is my very best friend here in Nashville. She has changed my daughter's life. We're going to learn about that. We'll talk about two of her cookbooks and what she is doing now. Um, po- post Pinewood Kitchen, which post she closed Pinewood down, Kitchen. which was yes. fun to hear about because yes. she's just amazing. You guys are going to love her. She's super intelligent, and um, we talk a lot about gut health, and it's really informative, one of our mm-hmm. most informative episodes. I agree. I and agree. we're here at Fort Houston, which is a really cool nonprofit for artisans. Um, they actually like offer space for artisans, and um, they are allowed to exhibit their art here for free as well. So if you want to check them out, go to www.forthouston.org. <laughs> now that I know you guys are out there in over in that direction, <laughs> I was raised to talk to everyone at the table. You know? She was yeah. raised to talk, which is, I want to say this, <laughs> do not hold your crazy. I want you to let your crazy out. Don't, don't keep the crazy in. Oh, but I'm so well dressed and well behaved today. Well. I have lip gloss and everything. <laughs> I did. So Mia is very fascinating. She is not only my best friend. She is an author. She has two cookbooks. She is a health and wellness coach, which we're going to go into really like a lot. She has helped change my daughter and her life. She's a rancher. She's a rancher. Can you believe that? Can you imagine her on a horse? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I can. (laughs) (laughs) She has, she has owned a a kitchen, Pinewood Kitchen, out in Mm -hmm. Pinewood near Nunley. Nunley, Tennessee. Nunley, Tennessee. Yeah, how far is that from Nashville? That's 46 miles from Nashville. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Pinewood, Tennessee. Pinewood, Tennessee. Okay. It's not really a town I made it up, but we'll get into that. Oh, oh, okay. (laughs) Great. (laughs) (laughs) But just welcome. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. I actually love what you all are doing, and I've loved watching Jamie go into this world with you, and I'm your biggest fan. I'm a fan of everyone that's participating in this. Because Jamie is sunshine to me. She is. And so I love that her sunshine gets to be shared with the world, and not just me. (laughs) <laughs> well, let's start with our friendship. Yeah. Let's tell everybody how we met. And we met at a dance competition. Mm-hmm. I was working on my solo. I'm a middle-aged competitive dancer. Can you imagine? <laughs> no, I'm not. But our children are. Yes. And we met when I had just, you had just come to Nashville, just mm-hmm. soon when you arrived. Yeah, yeah. And we became friends. And she said that John was the GM of the Titans. Now, this is going to tell you who I am with football, everyone. I was like, oh, okay. That's like GM of, like, Kroger, right? Like... <laughs> I just imagined, like, I don't know, when you said GM of a football team, and it just went right over my head. How did you figure it out? I think when I went to my first game. It was my first NFL game ever. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I was like, whoa, this is bigger than Kroger. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, this place is huge, and there's a lot of seats to clean. And I run a restaurant, so I was like, and there's a popcorn stand, and there's a beer garden. I was like, he's more than, you know. And then what happened is I really got to know him, and I got to see your life behind the scenes. And what he really is is he's a manager of humans. And he really, in like the most I don't know if that's a great way to say it, but he really helps guide the team and mm-hmm. the people that work there and inspire them. And he's been he's become one of my great friends, too. Yes, it's been really neat because uh, some when me had her restaurant, um, she would come over and sit with John and, and just, OK, John, you need to help me out. How do I go about this situation? How do I just guide me? So it's been it's been pretty neat to see your friendship with him evolve that as well. But he's really a coach in Mm -hmm. a way and he coaches maybe not the players down the way they throw the ball but he coaches the entire organization to stay connected to believe to participate and to um, be their best selves and he tries to see everyone as their best selves and so do I in running the ranch and the farm Mm -hmm. and my team in Pinewood is I really wanted people to just feel so good about their lives and their choices and where they work and where they spend their time. So John has been a great friend to me in helping me navigate situations. And it's funny because he'll talk about like 
the Titans. And I'm like, yeah, and I got this problem with this cowboy <laughs> <laughs> and my dishwasher. And he's like, me, just do this. But it's all the same. It's all about caring about the people you connect to and you work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So you guys don't known each other five years? Five yeah, years? it's been about five, five. years. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it was so much fun because the first time we really met was backstage. We were getting our girls ready. The girls had to dance, and we were talking so much. All of a sudden, we were like, wait, we got to go watch the girls. We need to leave. So we start walking out as the girls were walking back in. <gasps> totally missed the dance. She's like, don't tell Lola. Oh Just don't gosh. tell Lola. <laughs> that was amazing. Okay, Whereas so, Taylor was like, eh. You both have two daughters, correct? Yeah, we both okay. have two mm-hmm. girls. Okay, and yours, how old are your girls? My oldest is a freshman at Ole Miss. And my youngest is a sophomore. She's 15. That's where we I were met, going. Yeah. I, I met Lola, you right? You met Lola. Okay, yeah. Because when Cause we were doing John's. John's. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was fun. She was really sweet. Yeah, she's, okay. she's yeah, a I love, I love raising women. I mean, let's talk about it. We're yeah. raising women. Yeah. And no, what that like, means, raise them, you know, inspire them, guide them. Mm-hmm. It's amazing to watch you navigate because... I mean, there's been things in your life with like closing the farm and and things mm-hmm. like that that you do. It, I, it, talk to us about that, about your farm. Well, I own a working cattle ranch in organic produce farm. I raise bees, cattle, hogs, quarter horses. Um, I grow all non-GMO, uh, heirloom, biodynamic farming. So it's like gritty, real deal. It's a pretty big farm. Um, it started while well, my husband has been a rancher and a cowboy his entire life. His family for hundreds of years have been ranchers and farmers. And uh, they started the first chain of grocery stores in the United States called Winn-Dixie. Oh, and wow. that, um, I was so starstruck when she told me that. <laughs> I mean, when you're from South Louisiana, Winn-Dixie is a big yeah. deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Um, so they really um, brought you know, the individual cuts of meat to the marketplace and they changed grocery, well, I mean grocery stores. That's how they came to be. And then I got, re- I met my husband. I was vegan. How you doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> vegan cattle ranch. <laughs> and I was always like, ah, I don't know about this. But the thing about being married to Lee and living with the land and living and growing and raising food is it changes your entire perspective of life and what matters and what's valued. So um, I met Lee, married Lee live on this big ranch west of Nashville in Pinewood, Tennessee. And um, I was growing all this food and I got very sick. And I had ulcerations, the total circumference of my small intestine. And they were going to kill me because the ulcers, my intestines were gonna rupture at any minute and burst. Like any second I lived with, I could die right now. How did that begin? Um, how does it begin? I mean, it, ulcerations begin in the intestines because of bacteria in the intestines and their sores and their irritants, and then it's what is the intestines exposed to. So 15 years ago, when I was at my weakest, I weighed about 89 pounds. I was starving to death because I couldn't even swallow water. And I went to every doctor from Guadalajara, Mexico, to um, the Mayo Clinic, and they couldn't really, no one could explain to me what causes an ulcer. And I have this brain (laughs) that's like, I wanna know why. Mm -hmm. Like things don't just happen. It's not like, oh, it's like, what was the, what built us there? And that goes into like how I look at being a human too. Like what created me? I'm really lucky. I'm super beyond good friends with a woman named Dr. Joan Bornsinko, who's a Harvard cancer cellular biologist. And when I got really sick, she came and said, no, change your food. And I knew that the only thing that was touching the inside lining of my intestines was food and that I knew food could influence it. But 15 years ago, nobody was talking about it. Mm -hmm. There weren't all these wellness blogs and no one was talking about microbiome and ulcerations and fermented food. But I had access to this woman from Harvard and I was fed tons of information. Like I felt personally that God was opening a door for me. And so I changed my food. I said no to the medication, but I'm not anti-medicine. I think medicine is a blessing, use it, and then what can you do? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we work together with our doctors? Mm -hmm. So I started off in something called macrobiotics, which was the first type of whole foods, healing foods in the 1960s and 70s by Misho Kushi. And he was, it was basically Japanese healing foods, and it was my only option. There were no books on how to heal my gut, nothing. 
And so I started working with a woman who ran the Shaw Wellness Center in Spain. And she was like, you got to cook. And I hated to cook. I mean, I grew up Appalachian, okay? <laughs> I mean, fish sticks and food stamps. And I go to the grocery store and I just shop via the pictures on the box because they're yeah. pretty. And it said organic. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I cooked. And that's how we grew up. That's how we grew up. So I really had to learn how to cook. And from not from a place of I want to be a food blogger because that didn't even exist or <clears throat> I want to be a chef. I just wanted to live. I wanted to live. I had two little girls and my mother died when I was a teenager mm -hmm. and I was not leaving my kids. Mm -hmm. And so I learned to cook. The first thing I ever learned how to make was miso soup because it has seaweed. It has a pro, which is neutralizes radiation in the body. And it's loaded with trace minerals that are missing from our produce in the ground. And it had miso, a probiotic fermented food that I knew was going to touch the lining of my gut. Ding, mm -hmm. ding, ding. And I was going <laughs> to heal it. And then I learned about kuzu, which comes from the kudzu plant. And kuzu, if you add it to hot apple juice, it's actually, it thickens it and you drink it it's like hot apple pie and it forms like a band-aid through the intestines I started making my own aloe vera and I was the worst cook ever and I basically created a bunch of mush and put it on the table and my husband loved me so much this <laughs> southern boy that he wanted to see me swallow food and not fall over in severe yeah. pain yeah. that he would just eat it and my kids were like <laughs> And then I got better and I just wanted to learn. So did you go to school, like a formal education? I then did. I did the macrobiotic program with this woman. And then my husband had a project in LA. So we were living between LA and Nashville on the farm. I went to culinary school in Los Angeles. I enrolled in a program. I went in as a, a spy because I, I mean, your knife <laughs> skills are so good when you're macrobiotic because they're all about the energy of chopping. And I made a, one of my closest friends still today said, you're a spy. And I went, no, I'm not. Because you go to a program <laughs> and it's French classic and you don't want to be like, ooh, ooh, I know. Because they don't want you, you're there to know what they know. Right. And I couldn't eat anything that we were making because it was dairy and gluten. And I have, I'm celiac too, we found out. But you didn't know that. We didn't know that, but I knew I couldn't have dairy or gluten. Mm -hmm. I didn't so eat what, it. So what was your diet? then and now just so we know like um, what are what do you avoid well, well that comes to where we go now okay. so I went to culinary school French classic yeah. it was amazing I finished the program I would go home I would make whatever was made with regular butter and milk I would I would just figure out the fat the protein how could I do it how could I change it I mean I'm really like the OG <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> of nut milk. Yeah. I mean, I used to live in the jungle too, and I would pinch almonds to make my own nut milk to get the skin off. Wow. So I, I mean, I was just learning, becoming a master for my own self. Right. Um, move ahead. We had the restaurant, and uh, my, uh, the restaurant was an old 1920s general store located just on the corner from my farm. I turned it into a real food restaurant where I grew all the food, raised all the livestock, all the honey everything and everything was orchestrated to be inclusive because if we want to teach inclusivity around race around um, sexuality around raising children around religion we also have to teach inclusivity in everything mm -hmm. we have to teach people to think of others and to think that they're different than us but their needs are just as valuable as ours mm -hmm. so for me in my rural community i was really driven to teach inclusivity through food and if I could just drop it like it was hot, you know, that little bit of, oh, think of her, it's an inclusive table, then maybe that would find tentacles. So I ran Pinewood for seven years. Um, it was the most important thing I've done work-wise in my life. Besides my family is my most mm -hmm. important thing. But I really helped change that community. I mean, I became the best, in, the best job in the county was working for Pinewood. Wow. We paid $15 an hour to each server, a living wage, seven years ago because you can't ask people to live on just tips people want to know yeah. why is hospitality falling apart call me <laughs> no seriously yeah. I, I mean growing up well, I say growing up but whenever I was in college that's what I did was I was a server and mm -hmm. I think we made like two dollars an hour right with tips and if you didn't get and tips you, you got two dollars done and my rent was not being paid I mean, we really have got to get some things straightened out here and I really feel that I did that in Pinewood you know we really ended up on the map I became Southern Living's Cook of the Year, which was a big deal to me, yeah. McCormick, who couldn't even make cornbread 10, <laughs> 15 years ago. Yeah. But what happened is we had the flood in August that just mm -hmm. passed, and the Waverly Flood also hit Pinewood. We live on the Piney River, 
and this was my third flood I've been through. It was my second flood in six months, mm. and this was a whopper. And it was it worse this time or uh, the very first flood? This flood that we just had was worse. It was than we've ever been through out there. Uh -huh. It devastated the Pinewood community. So Pinewood is actually a real community. Mm -hmm. It was founded in the 1850s by a family, a man named Sam Graham and his brother. And they came from North Carolina and he didn't believe in slavery and he had a working farm and they called him eccentric because of that. So Pinewood was always this self-sustained community. They had their own mills, they raised their own food. Everyone was paid regardless of skin and color and whatever. And it was a really special place. And then my husband and his family bought Pinewood. And so Pinewood is the Pinewood community that's been there, but it's not uh, incorporated. So Pinewood to me was always a place of freedom. You know, mm -hmm. and I feel that freedom with food, food brings us freedom if we understand it and how to eat it and how to prepare it. Mm -hmm. And it can create an equal playing field for humanity if they have the right food. I like the way you put it. It creates freedom because it also, for families like mine mm -hmm. that have to be gluten-free, dairy-free, we could walk in there and eat anything we wanted. It was like we could finally be free. You know, and that's your love language is food. Mm. And it just, that's how we meshed and just mm -hmm. really, I mean, we're inseparable now. Yeah. I mean, it's done. <laughs> Laverne and Shirley, we're done. <laughs> yeah. We're done. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're done. We're done, y'all. But it is, it is. You know, I grew up, um, there were times in my life I was hungry as a child. I understand it. Um, I feel like I have both sides, you know, one side is this me mecca of grocery and food and the other side was Appalachian and hungry. So I get it all. I've had no food and I've grown an insane amount of food. Mm -hmm. Service is my love language. Yeah. I love to take care of humans. And I love what you, that you said you could come into my restaurant yeah. and you're like, whoa, someone thinks. And the old school, going back to f going to culinary school, French classic training and hospitality is this is how it's made. There are no substitutions. Mm -hmm. The old school restaurant said no substitutions. Yeah. The old chef was like, no, mm -hmm. I don't do it. And um, or what, maybe he didn't say it like that. You cannot, you cannot have it in no deli. It comes with cheese. See, yes. this is the crazy yes. I was talking about. It's yeah. slowly coming out. Well, it comes with cheese. You can, no, you're going to have cheese. But it's like, and I wanted to change that. But I also wanted to change the cook's perspective and take away that brutal emotional climate that occurs in a restaurant that is just relentless, you know, like, they're just dictators in that kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I wanted everyone to work and feel loved and connected to the customer. So when yeah. I did that, I had an open kitchen in this old general store and they would meet the woman who couldn't have the cheese. And <laughs> she always had roller skates oh, on roller or a tambourine skate. in her hand. I do play the tambourine. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna create YouTube tutorials. But <laughs> it, I wanted food to be fun. I mean, when you have almost starved, when you've starved as a child and you're hungry mm -hmm. and you've starved because you're in so much pain, you cannot eat and you're terrified that this food is gonna hurt you. Mm -hmm. Then you finally are up and you got mm -hmm. energy to roller skate and you can smile and you can cook mm -hmm. and yeah. you can throw down and you can keep up with the pace. I mean, how, why wouldn't you roller skate in your restaurant? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's tell your viewers, and this is actually kind of the first time that you've spoken out about what happened ever and when you closed the, the restaurant. Why don't you, you tell your, your followers how you're doing? I, I mean, the truth is, is I opened that restaurant. I always had this thing inside of me that I knew I, I was blessed to find my way through the kitchen and to find myself to wellness. And so I always felt like wherever I'm asked to serve, I'm going to show up. Like if any of y'all people said, Mae McCormick, could you come over here? Now I don't work 80 hours a week. I'm coming. Mm -hmm. I'm coming. And so I felt like I was brought there to serve and to learn and to grow. Yeah. And that we went through floods. And so what happened was the last flood was devastating and I was exhausted and I had gotten well. And then I spent seven years working an insane amount and I wasn't well anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was putting all this energy out into the world and I wasn't taking care of her anymore. And I have two girls and a husband and livestock and I just, couldn't do it anymore. And I was doing a lot of media. Yeah. Um, I was a contributor on three shows across the country, shooting from wow. home. And yeah. I just, I, it was like everything started to crumble. You know what? 
I could feel the crumble mm -hmm. way before it yeah. started. Like pieces of you just yeah. start, you're just wiping it off. Like you don't want anybody to see that you just drop some of you on the rug. Yeah. And you just, you know. Because you, you, when you talk to people, you smile no matter what. Oh, I do. And so the fact that you were crumbling, that was a lot of pressure. It was a lot of pressure. And I was full of inflammation again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I wasn't, I wasn't showing up everywhere. You know, when you've almost died and you know you're on borrowed time, I am borrowed. This yeah. moment is a miracle. I have no idea how long I'm gonna be well. And that's the truth and that's the reality for all of us. Um, but you know it's borrowed. You wanna be like up here. Like if I show up, I show up mm -hmm. or I don't go. I, I cancel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not coming, sorry. <laughs> but I just felt that I wasn't my best self. Like I wasn't me McCormick. I was. I was just feeling frazzled and crumbly and, and I was in pain again and it just wasn't well. And I stood on the front porch of the farmhouse and I looked at all the cleanup we had in front of us and I thought, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it anymore. And I prayed about it and I asked for guidance and I got inside myself and I just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And it was hard for me because I had a team like these people worked for me for seven years. Yeah. Restaurant turnover, COVID hit, we killed it in COVID mm -hmm. because I'm inventive and I'm a come up. So I was always looking, how could I shift? How could I maneuver? Mm -hmm. And I felt my whole community, I was letting them down and I was really sad about it. And then there were people that drove hours to eat in that restaurant yeah. because I don't do weird food. I do really good Southern food that's like the best uh, oil, the best, I mean, rice bran oil from California. So my makes. fried chicken, <gasps> You want to eat it because it's not nasty oil with chemicals. Mm -hmm. It had no chemicals in my oil. So it was just delicious. And I, I really got sad mm -hmm. because then, you know, as it became my identity. Right. So, you know, when your identity crumbles, yeah. you, um, you have to go, oh, wait, it's not my identity. I'm still it's me not McCormick. Worth, right. It's not worth your health. So. But it was amazing to watch you transition to understand that about yourself mm -hmm. and to know that you're not just a restaurant. You're not just that smile on Facebook mm -hmm. and those crazy lips. <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you're yeah. a mom, you're a wife, you're a friend. Yeah. It's amazing to watch you grow. Yeah, and to realize that our outside world doesn't define yeah. us. Mm -hmm. That our clothes, our shoes, our jobs, our friendships, mm -hmm. our marriages, our children, they don't define us. They're not our essence and our essence is in there. And this is the first media I've done in yeah. like eight, six months or whatever. Thanks. And thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, re I mean, when you asked me, I was like, really? But I don't do anything. I know. I'm she not that said interesting. that. She was like, what, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, I don't know nobody. I'm, yeah. not interested. I'm like, That's are you kidding me? Right. <laughs> no. I mean, you're not just the restaurant. Well, no, you're you're just not. That was a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was. And you've written two books. Yes. Third I coming. Mean, and a third's coming. So. Yeah. And you also have the fiction. Oh, books. and then I have three books after yeah. that I mean, that she's are busy. already through an edit that are not food, and they're all about <gasps> the archetypes of our personality, and the and they're quirky and funny and what I really love. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, can you tell us about your first two cookbooks? My I first two hear. cookbooks are really fun. So I wrote my first book. Before I met my husband and before I was a cook, I was in L.A. and I was a writer. When I was in L.A. and I was going to culinary school and I was seeing what was happening in culinary teaching facilities, mm -hmm. I realized that all the information that I had already mastered and learned in my journey with food wasn't being shared. I sat down and I said, I'm going to write a food book and I'm just going to write it because I have to tell there's a million me's. I know there's more than just me out there. So I sat down and I wrote my first book. No idea how to write a book. No idea how to write a food book or a cookbook. And I wrote it and I said, well, I'm just going to put it out into the world because um, that's the purpose is to share my journey. And this is when Amazon was doing its first beginning of Amazon their publishing deal. Amazon mm -hmm. books. Yeah, or, Amazon books yeah. like 10 years, eight years ago. I actually didn't just do it all by myself. I hired a company, a, a couple company called The Book Couple out of Florida. They said, well, we'll help you lay it out and we'll help you edit it and everything. So I wrote it, gave it to them and they helped me lay it out. So it was professionally laid out. And then we put it up on Amazon and it went, whew, that's done. I'm done. Peace <laughs> out. 
no more cookbooks. Mm-hmm. I did it. I told I told the story, and I sold twenty thousand books. Oh, wow! <laughs> Which in the publishing world is a big deal, because even celebrities nowadays do not sell ten thousand books. I ended up becoming a contributor on a nationally syndicated talk show called The Better Show. It would air here in Nashville. But it was all over the country, and the studio, it's owned by Meredith Studios, and it's shot in New York City in a real studio. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a real TV studio. And I remember going, I'm really going to do this? Y'all want me to do this? <laughs> and they taught me how to style my food, and I would, and it turned out to be a huge blessing. Mm-hmm. I would go to New York, and I would shoot all these episodes. I've, I made great friends from the show. Um, the host of the show, Rebecca Budding, who used to be on All My Children, became a great friend of mine. And JD, I mean, I just made friends. And I loved the crew. I mean, the crew is amazing. Okay, y'all don't know it. <laughs> but crews are amazing because you form this relationship. Like the goal is to create joy and positive information to go into the world for an hour a day. So I was all in. Mm-hmm. And um, I loved it. And I was on that show for a few years as a contributor. And uh, I sold a ton of books and built a social media following and then joined Today Nashville for four years as oh, a contributor. Awesome. I did everything from astrology girl and food. She sure <laughs> did do astrology. astrology She still does it to me. Oh, I love it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, who knows if it's true, but it's fun. It is fun. <laughs> That's so that, amazing. That's where I, I went yeah. on a journey. So anyway, sold a ton yeah. of these books. Then a publisher contacted me and said, ma'am, ma'am, do you know how many books you sold? And I go, no. And he goes, you sold a lot of books. And I took a meeting and then I did this book and it's with Simon and Schuster and their boutique division called HCI. Hello. <gasps> Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and this was really fun because this book is all about Pinewood. Hello. This is my it's community awesome. and the journey I love and the it. journey. Yeah. And I um, wrote about microbiome science. Mm-hmm. So that's what really came is the journey with microbiome science, because in two, up until 2009, there was no information to the public about microbiome. That means the bacteria in the gut and what bacteria are, how they influence digestion, healing, how they create mm-hmm. small chain fatty acids. None of this information was available to anyone. And I really had been ahead of it because of my friends and connections and the scientists I knew, and I just started writing about it. So this book has a whole deep dive in like simple, easy to read, basic, I call them the gut homies. That's your good gut bacteria. (laughs) And uh, that you can relate to and go, oh, wait, I don't have that bacteria. And then science came and brought these amazing tests called the Viome test. And it comes in a little kit that you do this wonderful, very Kardashian-esque stool sample test. Oh, gosh. (laughs) I mean, you don't even have to touch it. It's like got tissue paper. It's very pretty gold lame. She's coming out, y'all. Yeah, she's here. Um, But you don't even have to, like, scoop it. You just drop it in a net and get it and put it in a cup. No, because people are really intimidated by cooking and by checking their poop, right? (laughs) And I am like the poop lady. I'm like, let's talk Shadoobie. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's just food, okay? Mm. So the Viome test comes, and the Viome test is amazing, and it comes then through an app, or you can get it sent to your email, and it breaks down which bacteria you have too much of, which you don't have enough of, Mm. and which foods feed those bacteria. So if you have an excess category, which we all do, excess is huge in wellness, if you have an excess category here, then you want to know, well, what's creating the excess? And they say these foods. Then the foods that you're not eating enough of, because when you have an excess, that means you're avoiding foods Mm -hmm. and which bacteria you need to grow to balance the colony, right? We have a colony, right? right? It's like the bunch of pilgrims up in here. (laughs) (laughs) Up in here, back to the horse. (laughs) So, by the way, I'm terrified of horses. (laughs) I have a lot of horses. She is. She had to do that shoot right there. The um, she had, oh for the show was it for the show, and she's like Jamie, I, I'm really scared. They they want me to get on this horse. To You're go terrified. The farm. I can yes. ride too because I've taken tons of lessons. Everyone and my <laughs> husband is a cowboy. I'm talking chaps and yeehaw. And I am just like, okay, he's a big animal. We're going to go slow. And but that's because when I met him, I lied because I was a Hollywood girl. You know. And he was, <laughs> I was really cute and all that. The dog, the little dog and the hip huggers. And he was, and he was like, can you ride a horse? And I mean, I was like, yeah. <laughs> For sure. For, For sure. sure. For sure. And then he was like, okay. 
that <laughs> one's yours. And I was like, okay. And I got on the horse because I had ridden at the fair on that thing that goes around <laughs> in the pony. And I was like, I can do this. I'm fine. And and so he, I didn't know we were going to move like a hundred head of cattle with cowboys yelling and screaming. Oh my God. And it was like a scene out of a movie that hadn't been written. I was like, Whoa! <laughs> oh my god! I was sweating. I was so unattractive. <laughs> and then he looks at me, and goes, "I don't think you knew how to ride." A horse. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Can I help you like me? Oh. Could you like me? So now I just say, but I do ride. I've taken lessons, and I love. I love horses. How many people work on the farm? Oh man, in the high season, you know, I'll have anywhere. I could have ten people. Okay. If we're working cattle or doing something, then I'll bring in day crews. Harvesting on the farm takes another amount of people, but I uh, I have a good steady five full time people. Wow. To help. Even that alone is a big job without the kitchen. I yeah. Just can't no, and believe. I run the office. Yeah. And so it is. Uh, yeah, it is. And and you know the thing about farming, and this is what happened on the porch of the flood, and we we're driving, and and my house was fine, and my farm is fine, but my husband said something amazing to me. He said, you know. 50 years ago, you a tractor cost $3,000, $2,000. 50 years later, a tractor is $100,000. Mm-hmm. 50 years ago, you paid your help $4 an hour. Today, you've got to pay your help $20 an hour. 50 years ago, um, the land was valued for what it could produce, right? Land held its value at what it was good for, how it could support right. society. Now land is valued at who wants to buy it and own the most, Mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not the same Mm y'all. And so, and then to be an organic farmer and to have labor that it takes to get that food out. I mean, when I tell you I get dirty, I'm a, I'm a gritty girl. Absolutely. (laughs) Does your husband, your husband doesn't work full time. He has his own. My husband, my husband has written a few books and he's, he started in the mental health business. He started a place called the recovery ranch, which is out on the ranch and it's a wellness, you know, addictions, eating disorder. And then he started Integrative Life Center. And we owned the Canyon in Malibu. We were partners oh, wow. with Fred Siegel in Malibu. And then Altamira and Sausalito. So my husband is all about helping people transform and become their best selves. And I guess I am too with food. Mm-hmm. So do you do the food for those centers? I do. Oh, really? I have done them. But we've sold the majority of them. And now he's getting ready to do something else. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what he's Very doing. interesting. Wow. Yeah, we could go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> but um, where did we go? But that was the thing. So he said, you know, 50 years ago, th- that's what that's that's how it was. But now it's 50 years later. And pretty much what hasn't gone up is what you make off of work in a farm. Mm-hmm. So you're, all of your expenses are up here, but what you're earning for your product hasn't really grown in 50 years. So people, it's harder and harder and harder to farm and to ranch. And um, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. Mm-hmm. It's, kind of, it's kind of frightening. Oh, but then another test, the ALCAT test. Yes. So I talked about Viome. I want to tell you all about the ALCAT test. Yes. So what I learned through the Viome test and what I learned through writing these books is that we're all individual. So this whole concept that you can, you know, vegan works for everybody or gluten-free or no dairy or blueberries. Everybody eat blueberries. <laughs> you know? Yeah. How about kale <laughs> or mushrooms? And I love, I am a fun guy. I mean, I love mushrooms. <laughs> I mean, if I could be any plant in the world, I would. Did you all see the Fantastic Fungi? Best documentary ever. (laughs) I mean, I just want to be one. And I raise them. I do. I grow my own shit Takis. I thought you were about to say something. (laughs) My own shit. I do. I have my own fertilizer. Are we allowed to curse? I'm sorry. I don't know. I told you I was gritty. I mean, it's just, come on. I live on a ranch. Y'all don't even know. When my daughter was little, she came in the house. She goes, Mama, you know what? Those cows, they speak cuss. And I said, What? (laughs) She goes, the cows, they speak cuss. If you cuss at them, they listen. I said, How, why are you cussing? She was like five. I was like, why are you cussing? What are you talking about? She goes, the cowboys, they just cuss at the cows and the cows move. Oh, so this has to be Lola. Wow. Bella. Oh, what? That's that surprises funny. me. I know. <laughs> so the, another test that I learned about is called the ALCAT test. Your doctor can run it. Um, Viome, you can do yourself and you'll be, you are going down a fun the poop shoot, I mean, of like information. But um, the ALCAT <laughs> test I really love because what it does is it checks your body, your blood, and it 
checks what foods are creating inflammation, white blood cell reaction, which therefore creates inflammation. And everybody has a different food that they can eat or they can't eat. And so you're going to have a different list of foods that are for you. Like, so for me, my ALCAT test came back and I was having nodules. Like at the end of Pinewood, y'all, I had just wore myself out. My, all my joints swelled up. So my doctor ran this test and it came back and it was so interesting is the foods that I couldn't, I should need to avoid right now for now, for the next three to six months are the foods that I lived on, Mm. avocado, asparagus. Now, avocado is a great food Mm -hmm. for not me right now, but it will be. So that's what we have to do is we want to make, we love to make things bad, don't we, in society? We're like, bad. Mm -hmm. It's like we live in this society, and this is a rabbit hole and a little squirrel ride, but it's what I've been thinking about. We give permission right now. We we give a lot of permission for people to be things and do things, but we're super unforgiving. Mm -hmm. And so that's really crazy to me. So we get obsessed. Sorry, come bring it back. But we get obsessed with (laughs) foods and we want to make them bad or we want to make them good or soy is bad. And so we can be really mad at soy for a while. And I'm not saying that. (laughs) Right. True. Mm -hmm. So the soy is... um, I mean, for some people, soy is bad. Some people have soy allergies. They have soy reactions. They have certain disorders and autoimmune disease, and they can't have it. But not for everybody. And that's my message. Like, gluten for me is not my, it's my, you know, kryptonite. But for you, Mm -hmm. a healthy, great piece of bread might be fantastic. So, again, the ALCAT test is another test that's coming, and it's showing us what we can have and what we can't have. And so, again, I love this way of thinking. It just makes us think bigger. It makes yeah. us inclusive because we're science and food and diet is about to change yeah. and hit a lick when these, these tests are available to everyone. Let's, um, let's touch base on Taylor yeah. and your relationship with Taylor. Yeah. So, for our listeners, my 16-year-old um, has type 1 diabetes, alopecia, rheumatoid arthritis, well, which is now juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, and for years, she was on methotrexate for her rheumatoid. She was taking medicines for alopecia, trying to get her hair to grow back. And um, I met me. And she just, you're not pushy, but you suggest things until I do it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't, I don't think that you should ever say you should to anybody. No, you've been actually really amazing with our journey. Because people are, we have so much food shame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is out of control. Yeah. I mean, at least every human I know at one point in the day goes, oh, I shouldn't have. Yeah. Or I should, yeah. or, or or judges something about their relationship around food. Yeah. So we're just we beat the heck out of ourselves, and it's just it's awful. So we don't need another person telling yeah. me what I should or shouldn't. It's so cute though. You get so excited. Like when we decided to take her off a of methotrexate, well, you're like, thank. God. But I wouldn't say a dang word. You didn't. You I never would did. Not ever, because I'm never gonna. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a lady. Yeah. That's the other thing. Somewhere in society too, we gave up all our power, mm-hmm. and we were like, "Well, if I'm not a chef and I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a doctor. I can't help it." Yeah. And it's not true. I mean, come on, rural people been figuring it out. If yeah. you can plant it and you can grow it, you can figure out if it hurts your stomach or yeah. it doesn't. We decided to go down the journey with me, and me suggested um, acupuncture, which we started doing. Taylor did eliminate gluten. She eliminated dairy. You had her do her biome test. Um, And so we took it as the approach as food as medicine. Mm -hmm. And at the time, she was only 13 years old, and she received it. She was at an age to where she really wanted to receive the information. And you helped her. Auntie Me helped her. Oh. And her hair started growing back. And now, I mean, she's still bald. She still has spots. It's just the nature of the disease. Mm. And I think, I think the thing is, is that it has to be your own journey. It can't be my journey. I, like, I'm not someone who's going to come in and change your whole kitchen and tell you what. To, I mean, I might if you ask me. But, I mean, <laughs> you got to change your, it's got to be your journey. And you like I said, I'm not a doctor. And, you know, people get really mad when 
just so you know, they, they get upset when you say food is medicine because then medical people go, it's not medicine. Well, it's mm. not. It's just support the medicine. Yeah. My thing is, if you're going to take medicine, support the medicine in working. Yeah. And it has to be your journey. So for me with Taylor, I wanted it to be her journey. I wanted her to feel that these were her choices, not yours, not mine. They're hers. Yeah. And what could she do to support herself? And, you know, the methyltrexate, it really helps a lot of people. But how can you help the methyltrexate? You know, yeah. how can you get your body to a place that it maybe doesn't need it if you're lucky? Yeah. And she happened to be someone that got really lucky and her body mm -hmm. didn't need it anymore. Yeah. So the thing with Taylor is it's been like, Taylor, what do you like? And I t I've said a few times, what is your excess here? So when you raise livestock organically, we go, what do they have too much of? So if they have too, if they're in a pasture that has a certain nutritional profile that grass is a type of grass it has more sun more water whatever it's that that grass is an excess because they've been there too long <clears throat> so we know it's not working so then we move them and then we figure out what minerals they were lacking because they had so much of this and not mm. that so if you're only eating seven things like americans potato tomato corn soy mm -hmm. i'm not mad at it um and, you know <laughs> chicken or i don't know beef whatever mm -hmm. if those are the seven things cheese that you're eating in different forms, then you've got an excess and you're not getting a lot of other things that you need. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just to point out to her that variety feeds the gut homies mm -hmm. and that um, if we could get this sort of, again, this really diverse culture up in here, <laughs> then we would have balance in our body. And that she, yeah. these were the foods that would she wasn't eating Oh, mm. she was so picky. Ooh. Oh, gosh. Picky. <laughs> it was so picky. bad. Are your kids picky? Jess is so picky. I can't I'm really? sitting here thinking about that. I'm Wait. like, she's getting oh. way too much of a lot it, of stuff. That's no, what happens. Because she only eats five things. It's, well, that, and then we it wonder changes. why later we're not well. Mm. But it only changes if you help them change. But mm. you can't yell at them. You can't get mad at them. You, and it's a lot of work have to take care of you mm -hmm. and then you have to find a way to integrate it on the table mm -hmm. and you have to find a way to support them in the food journey as opposed to you know because we created the monsters because we have these children's menus right yeah. and then you do you have an entire generation of people that now only eat kid food mm -hmm. and they're they're like i'm piggy and i go okay how's your poop you know, like, no, I, don't. I don't but i think it just so you know so when you tell me that i'm going yeah <laughs> but to watch taylor get in the ring and make her own decisions you know and she's doing it again right now she just yeah. did her alcat test that we talked about uh, her doctor ran it and she's got all the chemicals that her body's reacting to which is fascinating mm -hmm. and uh the additives and the preservatives in the foods and she's rotating again and so she's figuring it out yeah and what it does is it teaches children and it teaches us how capable we are, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we're in a place of fear. I mean, our society has been just bait up mm -hmm. and we feel like we've lost all control mm -hmm. and we don't know how to make things happen. It gives us control. Yeah. So people, gives us faith in ourselves. People don't have access to you personally, like Anymore. Taylor, but... So besides these two tests, do you just recommend doing that Alcat every six months? Like what well, is, I what's recommend kind of buying my Pinewood yes. Kitchen, <laughs> a Southern book. Culinary Cure, and book. following me on Instagram at <laughs> me with three E's, McCormick. So, um, <laughs> uh, but I just know everyone's going to be like, gonna I want be, access. Everybody's going to be DMing me their poop. Yes, they are. <laughs> Yep, just that's that will be our sign off is just DM her, your poop results. We do. We talk about it, though. Seriously, like she actually had an attack this past week and she was quite sick for yeah, about sick two to three week. days. Mm. And I, I was like, me, this is gross, but I can ask you this. How when you're when it ends, when you finally like have a release with your intestines, how is it like, is it just a lot of poop? And she's like, it's a lot of corn. <laughs> A lot of corn. <laughs> I ate too, nuts. I ate too much. Of oh, it was. Well, nuts. I, I have I have a <laughs> oh narrowing God. in my intestine from scar tissue, so I the thing that life keeps me humble because I still have to some days I can't get up, and it hasn't happened in like nine months. But I have a narrowing in my intestine and. I suffer partial bowel obstructions, which is the most painful. It's I had two kids. I didn't even know I was in labor because I've lived with such insane mm. pain, and um. 
And when I got to the hospital, we were like, you know this baby's coming, right? <laughs> That's its head. <laughs> <laughs> it's crowning. <laughs> well, well. I thought it was a hemorrhoid. <laughs> um, <no. laughs> That's it. That's another oh clip. My gosh. That's a clip. I thought that was a rod. No, but I mean, I've lived with such excruciating digestive pain in my life that with these partial obstructions, um, that it humbles me. And I go down, and I mean, I mean, I it's brutal. And so I really appreciate a nice shadoobie. Mm-hmm. I mean, a nice smooth move, and we're all better. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, don't you all feel better? When you've had a nice movement. Well, I mean, I just need moderation <laughs> around here. Okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so well, what's your new book about? <gasps> oh, this is going to be so fun. Oh, gosh. This new book is called The Juicy Bits. Oh. And it's all my juicy bits. I mean, not all my juicy bits. <laughs> <laughs> it's the juicy bits. It's really, I wanted to write a memoir. So I've been deep diving. Um, through my emotional journey of um, all the things I've been through in my life and the foods that saved me, the mm-hmm. recipes that made me, and the stories and the truth. I'm going to write about the truth of running a kitchen and being mm-hmm. a female working and running a ranch and running a kitchen as a female chef. I mean, and that's tough. Mm-hmm. And I want to write the stories, you know, the mm-hmm. stories that I couldn't put on Facebook about what was really happening in, in my community, in my kitchen. And uh, so it's a memoir cookbook, and it's like the juicy bits, you know? It's like all the good stuff at the bottom of the pan that you only share with those closest to you in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so it's the secrets. It's the journey. And uh, I'm really loving it. You know, it's not TV me. It's me. And it's uh, what I want to talk about. Yeah. When will that come out? January 2023. It's due June 15th. Pray for me. Oh, wow. (laughs) I'm like the biggest (laughs) procrastinator ever right now. (laughs) And I'm excited about the juicy bits. Yeah. That's awesome. That's okay, be. and then you have three fiction I books? I have three books that are fiction. Okay. They're called The Adventures of Princess Know-It-All. Wow. She don't know nothing. <laughs> 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 and, and that's really, they're really, they're they're quirky and funny. So and those are out or that no, you're no, working no. on? No, no, no. Those, okay. the first edit's done. Okay. I'll take the summer off and then I'm going to hit those like a brick in the fall. Wow. And finish that edit. And then they'll be coming out. So yeah, I became a writer. And you're busy. busy. I'm busy. You're busy. I'm not as busy as I was. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, you still sound busy. What else? Did we leave anything <laughs> on? I don't know. Busy. No. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh-huh. Thanks and for being me. open and about the farm. And because I know how hard that was for you. Yeah, it was terrible, by the yeah. way. I mean, people think floods, you know, Louisiana, South Louisiana, yeah. where you're from, got mm-hmm. hit. And people think floods and these natural uh, disasters happen and the sun comes out the next day and a week later we forgot. But, man, it took me months to come back. And then, you know, just all the things that happen in between. You just, it's all the things that happen in between. Mm -hmm. Life is happening. And it is, you know, I used to think, okay, this storm is going to blow out and then it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. It's going to keep raining. You know, it's going to keep thundering and you got to find a way to be fine when it's raining. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think you have. I think you're over it. I think we are. Not over it, but you know what I mean. Started from the bottom, now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Started from the bottom, now the whole thing. Oh, my God. Okay, wait. One thing. You said you lived in a jungle? I lived in the jungle. I have to know about this. before. So we my husband and I are rural adventurous. Can you tell? <laughs> I always said, I could have had one hot, dang it, big house with a pool. Yeah. <laughs> But instead, I got uh, cows and horses and adventures. And so I always knew I wanted a big life. When I was um, when I was 17, my mother was killed in a car accident. And a week later, my two best friends were killed in another car accident. Wow. And four days after that, my grandmother died. And so it changed me. And it said, you better get out there. I swear I heard them. They mm. were like, you better get out there and have a big life. Don't get caught up with big stuff. Because that's a distraction and a lie. And I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew that always. And so I wanted a big adventurous life. And I met my husband and he is adventurous and he's so fun. He is a good time. (laughs) He's a good time. He's just great. And uh, we were living in L.A. and his projects, he sold the canyon in Malibu and his project in Sausalito in San Francisco ended. And we were sitting there and he goes, we need to go have an adventure. These kids are still little. We need to go. And he's also a surfer. He loves to surf. Mm. And I was like, uh, 
I don't want to go. I think this is great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was like, no, we're going to go. So we ended up moving to Sayulita. And this was 14 years ago. And I had a baby. And I had a four-year-old. And um, we thought it was a great idea to live in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Before it was, now it's been even more modernized. And we packed up and we moved and I had no internet, and I had to, you know, to get my gas delivered, I'd have to listen for the truck that delivered the gas, and then you didn't know when, and this is how you knew it was coming. It would go, womp, womp, wanna, ch- wanna, sonic gas, <laughs> womp, womp, wanna, ch- wanna, sonic gas. And my kids would be yelling, and I'd go, wait, I think that's the gas man. <laughs> <laughs> womp, womp, wanna. So I lived, you know, snakes in my house, snakes wrapped around the toilet seat, crabs, <gasps> like, ch- ch- my Lola's terrified of bugs I did it to her and then you know the whole butt worms thing would go always back to the butt but I mean they check every month every every full moon people they're marking on their calendars to like get rid of parasites and then it got wild because of the narcos and the grenades and they had to take my kids out of the car my husband was traveling because he had businesses here in the ranch and and then I finally and then I got really really sick at that point that's Mm -hmm. when I hit the bottom and I was just then the doctor from Cedar sinai called and said you need to get out of there because if you get any kind of parasite or typhoid or anything you're gone (gasps) and that's when i came back to nashville and changed my life but i've lived in the jungle and i lived in israel i lived in israel for six years before my husband and in and out like i had an israeli life for six years in and out of israel um and i speak hebrew and spanish Things people don't know about me. Uh-huh. What brought you to Israel? <laughs> now, now I have to know. What brought you to so, Israel? Uh, okay. I had an Israeli boyfriend mm-hmm, oh. for six years. And uh, we traveled back and forth. And the first time, I, I mean, I was raised, my, I'm half Latin. So I was raised in a very Catholic environment. Half Latin. I'm like a Latin hillbilly. And um, <laughs> and we was wild. And so, you know, I grew up in a house where they spoke Italian and there was Spanish spoken. And then, so I always heard languages. And then when I met him and he spoke Hebrew, I never had been around anybody. I mean, I'm Appalachian hillbilly. So I was like, what is it? And then I loved it. And he was like, Moni Shema, Atatzame, Atanukulo Shilid. I just fell in love with Israel. And I loved, and when I was, when, after my mom died, I had gone to be a nun because that's what you do. And, uh, but it didn't work out clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my so God. I was like really Catholic, okay. <laughs> and then I tried to convert to Judaism because I'm like, fine, this is my path. And uh, that didn't work out either. I kept a kosher wow. kitchen for a while. I mean, I have had incarnations. You so have I'm about that. to have another one. That is wild. This is me in the womb right now. Mm. I'm in the womb. <laughs> I'm in the womb with you. This <laughs> is the womb. By the way, this place is amazing. It is oh, awesome. Yes. I, like, I want to be y'all's best friend. You're going to be sick of me, McCormick. <laughs> We're at Fort Houston for our listeners, and it is beautiful. There's it so much stunning. art. And it's it's art. And I always felt yeah. that what Nashville was missing was was this level of art, right? Mm-hmm. The beautiful. arts, not just music. Yeah. You know, and I know television and film is here, and it's great. But, I mean, I love this. I love the mediums. I want to see it. I want to smell it. Yeah. It smells oh good up in here. Gosh. It feels like creativity, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Mee's going to have to be like our first part two to once her other book I know, out, right? She is so, I feel like we only got like a little bit of who she is and I what's know. going on. So thank you so much yes. for being on. I love being here. You're so interesting. I love it. And I love that everybody got to, thank you. to meet you. And, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. And thank you for letting the crazy come out. Yeah, well, I mean, it's real hard to talk in <laughs> You don't have your pearls on. I don't. No, I don't have my pearls on. No, I mean, I just don't want to tuck it in anymore. Yeah. That's the beauty of age, right? Good. Don't tuck it in. And And Lola's not mad at you anymore whenever it comes out. No, no. Now Lola says in the backseat of the car coming home from the dance competition yesterday, she, I'm talking about something. We took my dog to a dance competition. It was uh, anyways. And I was talking about how I had processed that with Jack before we went. I was like, I just want you to know you're going to be in a hotel. It's going to be fine. (laughs) (laughs) She was like, now her thing is mom. Wrap it up. (laughs) Wrap it up. Oh my gosh. Reel it in. <laughs> oh, reel it in. That's, That's hilarious. Awesome. I love it. Okay. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, y'all.